Hello, welcome to the Connected Table Live with your hosts, Melanie Young and David Ransom, your insatiably curious culinary couple. Each week, we bring you movers and shakers, front and center, and behind the scenes in the world of food, beverage, and hospitality. Now, David and I are going to switch gears, and just to set this up, I'm looking at a table. And we have one, two, three, four, four beautiful bottles of sake and this adorable little can. And so we're going to be talking about one of my favorite beverages, and I think David will echo, sake. Uh, And not only sake from Japan, but sake made in Oregon. Uh, We are lucky to have on right now Steve Volsecki. I hope I got that right. Volstecki, who is a native Oregonian and the founder and CEO of Sake One, which is based in Oregon. Steve actually comes from the wine industry part of the family, uh, and he has worked in the industry for many, many years and is a big supporter of uh, the Oregon uh, wine industry and actually anything that is craft Oregon. His family founded the renowned Oak Knoll Winery, which is one of Oregon's pioneer wineries in 1970, and he has also worked as general manager and sales manager for Arath Vineyards and served on the Oregon Wine Marketing Board and the Willamette Valley Vintners Association. Uh, he founded Saki One in 1992. It is the only American-operated sake brewery focused exclusively on premium sake in Oregon's wine-rich Willamette Valley, and he also imports some of Japan's finest sake. Welcome. Hello. Greetings from Oregon. Welcome, Steve. Nice to have you from the left coast calling in. Thanks so much. Hey, my pleasure. How you know, is, uh, just a question, is harvest on or off now in, in Oregon? Where are we with the wine harvest, just out of curiosity? Well, my, my friends in the wine business were very happy. We had a warm growing season. The harvest started early, and most of them wrapped up about two weeks ago, which okay. is probably two to three weeks earlier than normal. Yeah, that is a little bit earlier than normal. That's great. Yeah, and I've heard nothing but uh, rave reviews so far. Anytime you get a dry harvest in Oregon, you're going to have happy winemakers. <laughs> you're, a, you're a happy winery, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so true. Well, you know, we're thrilled to have you on the show, Steve. I think I first got in touch with um, Saki One and first tasted it in New York a couple of years ago at an Oregon tourism event that I went to, and I was so thrilled to be able to try it. Um, and But then it kind of went to the back of my mind a little bit, because to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about sake, which is, of course, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the show, so that we could learn. But also, it's you know not in my wheelhouse every day like spirits are and wine is, so it's, it's, it's lovely to have you on and be able to talk about an, uh, a product that's a little bit new to me, even though I've been having it for many, many years, uh, and really kind of get an insider's view as to what sake production is and, what, and, and how sake fits into the lexicon. Uh, so welcome to the show, and, and um, why don't you first tell us a little bit about uh, what got you started and moving away from wine and wanting to go into sake production here in the U.S.? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I grew up, as you mentioned, I grew up in, in my family's winery, uh, really uh, from the time I was 10 years old. Grew up making wine as a kid, uh, went to college. I already knew how to make wine, so I said, what we really needed as a winery was marketing, sales and marketing skills, so I studied that in college, got out, immediately went to work along with the other Oregon wine pioneers trying to get Oregon wine uh, on, the, on the U.S. map, which was, was no easy task back in the 80s. Not only was it tough to get Oregon um, – known, but um, the, the main variety was Pinot Noir. Well, right. Pinot Noir in the 1980s, that was a, a tremendously difficult sell. You, you might not think of that today, um, but it was very tough. The, the variety did not, did not have a great reputation in the United States. Uh, we go around to restaurant tours around the United States and try to show them Pinot Noir, and they would taste it, and they go, oh, this is very nice, but nobody buys Pinot Noir. Right. Well, that really didn't change till like 2003, 2004 when the movie Sideways came out. <laughs> and <laughs> suddenly Pinot Noir was all in the fashion. Well, the quality was, had really risen through the years. And, and Oregon really took a lead in promoting the quality there. But it was a long road to get to where Oregon is today. 
So when I left ERAF in 2007, I did some wine consulting, ran a custom wine, custom crush winery for a year and a half. And actually, uh, a recruiter called me and, and said that there's this opportunity in Oregon that you might be interested in. Um, and I said, well, what is it? And they said, well, it's, uh, it's, it's running, a, uh, running a company, it's, and it's an adult beverage company. I said, a what? <laughs> I really hadn't heard that, that term before. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of weird, adult beverage. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sounds sound, sounds a little nefarious. Sounds dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, believe me, I, all kinds of things went through my head. Anyway, um, but uh, when I found out what it was, um, and actually, I'll have to correct you. I, I didn't actually found the company, but um, did actually tour the sake one facility even before they brewed a drop of sake, because one of my my grape growers um, actually was the general contractor that built the sake brewery in 1997. Mm -hmm. So I actually toured it. So who would have known, uh, you know, 15, 15 years later, I'd be, I'd be running a company, but getting back to getting into sake, I, I really think that what really struck me about this opportunity was no different than trying to, you know, create an image and a demand for, for Oregon Pinot Noir, um, craft sake, premium chilled sake, it's sort of the same challenge today because most people when I, I ask, you know, if you had sake before, they go, oh, sure, I've had hot sake, little cups in a sushi restaurant, or I've had sake bombs. So I go, oh, well, you, it's almost better to talk to people that have never had sake before because, unfortunately, a lot of the hot sake out there is 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 really the sort of the lowest quality level. So it's, if, if you're tasting a new beverage category for the first time, it, I would only hope that you would have a good expression of that to, to sort of guide you and, and make you want to come back to the category again and get and learn more about it. So quite quite the challenge, but uh, like I said, I'm up for it and uh, enjoying it immensely. Well, it's it's funny you should mention the hot sake thing because you know my certainly my first. Um, introduction to sake was probably hot sake as most Americans have and um, and uh, you know when you walk into a Japanese restaurant and, and order your sushi they will they like you you ask for sake and their immediate question is would you like hot sake or cold and rarely back especially back in the 80s and 90s when sushi really became kind of popular in the United States were people given a list of sakes to choose from but that's really changed over the last probably five or ten years I think with the influx of really good premium sakes coming into the U.S. Uh, tell us a little bit about kind of how that has changed how the industry has changed to really not only start promoting those but also for the for the restaurant going public to start accepting them. Well, really, the, the whole the whole segment of premium premium sake is really only about 40, 40 years old, and that even goes back to Japan, and and really technology drove the the whole premium sector. And what I say that is um, rice, you know, sake is such a basic beverage. It's and a lot of people are confused what it is. They think it's distilled, or they think it's rice wine. Well, it's not wine. It's not distilled. It's it's really just four basic ingredients, and the, the two primary ones are rice and water. Well, when when the technology turned the corner about 40, 50 years ago in Japan, they learned how to take the rice grain and, and developed a mill, no different than when, when you'd mill barley or what, what have you, that could actually take a rice grain, mill away the outer layers of the grain, which have higher levels of fats and proteins, and which also don't really lend themselves to, to fine sake, mm -hmm. and allow sake brewers to only brew with the center part of the grain, which is where all the starch is, and which lends itself to premium sake. So once that happened, all of a sudden you start having these sakes, when you drink them cold, have these almost similar wine-like qualities, a wide range of aromas, flavors, and the, and the texture we can talk about a little bit later, I think, which is particularly compelling about sake. But that really drove it. So it, it's really the whole concept of chilled premium sake is not is only about 40, 50 years old on the planet. 
So, so in a lot of ways, there's a lot of similarities to winemaking then because you're taking grapes and you're pressing them off the skins and, the, and you're de-stemming them and you're taking all this, anything that's going to make it uh, bitter or impure away uh, and using what's basically the heart of the grain uh, to create the better product. So it, it's kind of an interesting correlation. I can see how you'd be interested in it. Yeah, definitely. It's almost like uh, reducing yields on a vine to, to accentuate quality. Yeah. Dropping fruit on the ground and, and allowing the fruit that's left to become you know, very flavorful. And one of the other key ingredients is there's a particular mold that also is um, in sake as well or that's in sake making. Tell us a little bit about that because it's really one of the key ingredients and, and one of the key pieces of the puzzle. Uh, Absolutely. But it's, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's something that really no, nobody, including me, knows anybody anything about. <laughs> Well, you know, in, in winemaking, they use some, some actually different types of bacteria to change some of the acidity structure to soften and mellow the wine. Well, in, in sake making, we use a, a mold spore. And you think, well, why would you introduce something like mold? The last thing you would think about in a quality product is introducing mold. Well, this mold is called koji, K-O-J-I. And the koji mold spore, when we, when we apply this to freshly steamed rice, and put it in a nice warm room with high humidity, that, that mold spore actually is the catalyst that actually penetrates the rice grain and turns that starch that's in the rice into glucose. So now you have a fermentable source of sugar. So literally without koji, you could not make sake. Right. So it, it is a vital ingredient. And it, it does lend some texture and flavor to the finished product, but it's really the rice and, and the yeast, which is the fourth, in, the fourth component, that really drive the aromatics and, and the flavor in the sake. So rice, water, yeast, and koji. I'm curious about the koji. Is koji something that grows in Oregon and why that's why it, it's conducive to producing sake there? Or is it something you have to bring in from Japan? Yeah, we, we bring the yeast and the koji spores in from Japan. Um, the water, of course, is local. That's actually a reason why Sake One was sited here uh, just outside of Portland. Um, the uh, partner founding, uh, the, the partner that helped found Sake One is, is a brewery called Momokawa Brewing of Japan. And they tested water around the United States and found that the water right here in Forest Grove, Oregon, was very similar to the water they use in Japan. And the water is an extremely important element, uh, ingredient for sake. Uh, you know, bad water, you can't make good sake. So um, that, that's why it was cited here. The rice, actually, there, there is no rice currently grown in Oregon. So we, we get it uh, to, to the south in the north part of California, the Sacramento Valley. Grows right, there's a, a, lot, of, there's a lot, lot, of rice in, lot of rice in California. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, half a million acres, primarily yeah. the medium grain, similar type of rice you'd buy in the store and put in your cooker, uh, and it makes great tasting sake, too. So is, is, is medium grain the type of rice that you want? Is, is it a particular style or a particular um, type of rice that is best for it, or could you basically use any rice? You Well, you could use any, not any type of rice. I would not use any of the wild rice, jasmine rice, those types. But any of the what are you know start off as brown rice and then become white rice that you would you would buy can, can make can make nice tasting sake. We're a little limited in the amount of varieties of rice that we can brew with. In Japan, they've got literally a hundred different sake rice types. And when I say sake rice, these types of rice have been hybridized specifically for sake making rather than for table rice. And, and, and you, you, I'm sure you're asking, well, what, what does that mean? Well, those rices take the, the starch in the rice and really concentrate it in the center of the, the rice grain. So when they mill away the outer layers of the rice grain, most of the starch is concentrated and still there. And those are the rice types that really make the, the very high level, the, what we call daiginjo grades. And that means 50% of the grain has been milled away. Mm-hmm. So literally, you've taken half of the rice grain and, and pulled it off as flour and just discarded it or used it for something else, and you're only 
fermenting with half the original grain. So you're really you're really using truly the heart of the grain itself. You're you're everything else is just gone. None, none That's of the right. Other layer. Yeah. That's so right. of course, what you're going to get is a better quality. Sure, I can I can completely see it actually. <laughs> you know, well, it, you can taste it too. <laughs> well, we well, well we as taste matter, it. As a matter of fact, we tasted a little bit last night, and we tasted it today too. And you know, it's a kind of a good segue. Um, one of the uh, I remember about. Oh, 15 years ago, I was at a wedding, and um, and one of the things they gave out to all the guests uh, was a little cedar sake cup, uh, which is made out of wood and square. Is that one of the best? Is that the best thing to drink it out of? Is or or can you basically use anything? Well, it's a very traditional way to drink sake, yeah. but I I would not say it's the best. In fact. No. Uh, you probably aren't going to find a lot of restaurants in the United States that would serve sake in those because, um, you know, the, the, uh, probably not the, probably is not really con, con, condoned in terms of use. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of states probably would outlaw the use of that. From right. The, but, but that's, it's, it's a very traditional means. It's called, actually called a Masu cup, M-A-S-U. Okay. And it has a very historical meaning, uh, in Japan which is why it sort of translates over here. You'll find some restaurants that will take a, um, oh, like a small uh, like a shot glass style and actually set that in the masu cup. Mm-hmm. And when the, the weight person pours it, they'll fill up the, the glass and then overflow it into the masu cup. And that's a sign of generosity by the restaurant. So you would right. drink the glass and then you could actually pour, you could drink out of the masu cup or you could pour the extra into your glass right. and drink right. away. Well, I actually have my wedding masu cup. And uh, we actually tried it out of that last night. I can imagine in a restaurant it would probably not be quite the most hygienic thing to use, though. So I can I can see I can see why they stay away from it. Exactly. <laughs> it's also not the easiest thing to drink out of. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I used so. an espresso cup. It was a lot easier last night on my lips. Let's talk a little bit about your um, selection of sake. You you import and you also produce. Um, you want to talk about uh, the ones that are produced here in the U.S. first? Absolutely. We have three brands uh, that we make here in our brewery. Um, we call them Oregon Craft Sake. The uh, flagship brand is Momokawa mm-hmm. uh, from the uh, Momokawa Brewing in Japan. We, we, we were able to use that name, and, and uh, that's our flagship brand. We have six different sakes we brew under the Momokawa brand, um, and those are you know, our sort of classic uh, Japanese-style sakes. Um, then we have uh, our G sake, the, the lowercase G, in a very distinctive black bottle. Um, and the G stands for Genshu, which is Japanese for undiluted. So that's a bigger, bolder, more kind of rich style of sake. Kind of fits the uh, American palate for, for um, you know, fuller, richer foods. Mm-hmm. Intense flavors, et cetera. Intense flavors, exactly. And then the yeah. third the third brand is Moonstone. And Moonstone is actually, we were the first sake brewery in the world to make uh, uh, flavor-infused sakes. So we take our base sake and then infuse them with natural flavors like Asian pear, mm-hmm. uh, plum. We, we make one called coconut lemongrass. Well, that was the one we tried last night. It was actually delicious. And, and it, not only that, but I think it's got a double use because you could, my thought was that you could also marinate with it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. can marinate it and you can also – sake works whether it's the, the uh, infused sakes, the Moonstones or the Momokao or the G. Yeah. They're great bases for making sake cocktails. Well, it's funny because yeah. – Sake cocktails are kind of hot these days, and um, and I've certainly seen a bunch of them around, uh, not only in Japanese restaurants, but in some of the great cocktail bars that you go to, especially in New York, uh, which has a great sake following. Um, one of the things I did last night when we were trying the sakes um, was I threw a picture up on our Connected Table Facebook page uh, that um, said that I was do- doing my research, and it showed all six bottles that we had uh, of Sake One's product line. And... One of my friends emailed back or, or commented back and said, G is our current favorite in our household these days. So you've obviously got a following, even in Tennessee, which is where that comment came from. <laughs> That's great. Actually, G is our fastest growing brand. So I think, like I said, it really, it really kind of fits the, the American palate. We just like big, bold flavors. And, yeah, and that, we do. That actually, the, the G stands up to even you know grilled meats you'd think that 
you know, kind of like the white wine with fish, you know, red wine with meat, you know, that you'd kind of lump sake with the white wine things. Generally speaking, yes, but the G is bigger and bolder and it's, it's really a fun, fun taste experience to try it with, with, with meat. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful product. You know, uh, some of the thing, one of the things that might be confusing to folks that are don't don't know a lot about sake is the different styles that are available. We have a few minutes to talk, and I'd love for you That's to just kind of roll mm-hmm. through uh, hey. Junmai and Junmai Ginjo, and 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 just the different types that you can get in about um, two minutes. And then, <laughs> okay. al- and then also, and then also, obviously, plug sake one and how people can find it. Yeah, you bet. Well, sake, there's about seven or eight Japanese terms. The terminology, once you learn those terms, you're really a sake expert. So you have kind of moving up the quality ladder. You have Junmai, which basically means um, there's been no alcohol added, made completely with rice, water, yeast, koji. And generally speaking, the rice is milled to 30% of the grains been taken away. Next level up, Junmai Ginjo means you've milled away 40% of the grain. And that's, that's what we produce at Sake One exclusively Junmai Ginjo, quality level. Then you can move up the ladder to the highest level, which is Dai Ginjo. 50% of the grain's been, been milled away. And you're, um, those are the, it's sort of like the reverse of wine, where the, the higher you move up the ladder in quality, the more ethereal, refined the, ex, the taste experience is. It's really not about uh, big boldness. It's about more refinement and elegance and subtlety. And that's, not that you can't get those at the lower levels, but but and, and I think for for a neophyte to sake, jump in anywhere at at the Junmai level, the Ginjo, and just it's no different than experimenting with wine. You know, a lot of people start with sweet wine and move palate gravitates towards dry. With sake, you you can find the same thing. You can find, and we're talking all these are all the the clear sakes. Right. Um, we actually find in America. The cloudy or unfiltered sakes, which are called nagori, are extremely popular. Um, we actually don't filter out all the rice sediments, so it's kind of a light milky color. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I can't explain it. Americans love it. Well, Steve, um, tell us uh, your website and socials as we're going to be wrapping up where more information can be provided on sake one and sake. Absolutely. Well, we've got great education on our website, which is sake1.com, S-A-K-E-O-N-E.com. You can find us on Facebook at Sake One Oregon. Our Twitter account is at Sake One. Instagram, Sake One Oregon. Pinterest, Sake One. Oh, and YouTube, some great, great educational videos on, on our actual production process here. Uh, YouTube is Sake One Cura. Um, we're located just outside of Portland. We've got a great tasting room. You can come and tour tour the sake brewery. We've got tours three times a day. Um, we love to teach people about sake. Yeah. It's not just for sake. It's not just for sushi. You can have sake with any type of food, any type of occasion. And well, you certainly come out can. And you certainly can, and uh, and we actually do. We love sake, and uh, and are learning more about it every day. Steve, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us, and not only teach our viewers, but teach us a little bit about this really wonderful product, uh, folks. This is David Ransom and Melanie Young. Uh, you are listening to the Connected Table live on W Four C Radio. And uh, thank you. Thanks so much. 